Today we're joined in studio by international polo players Siobhan Herbst and uh, Sebastian Donay. Uh, you're very welcome guys. You've had a very busy last few weeks. Um, Sebastian, I might actually start with you because you've had the World Equestrian Games uh, Polo Championships and then you've had qualifiers for the World Championships. So it's been really hectic. Um, tell us first of all, uh, starting in Normandy, um, how the World Equestrian Games went. Uh, really, really well actually. They were in, in Chantilly, mm -hmm. just outside Paris. And um, we actually lost to the English team in the final, but we came second, so second team in Europe. So it was, it was an amazing event, actually. And you've had two silver medals, um, yeah. not to boast, but that is a fantastic. Yeah, and the world, uh, in the world qualifiers, we, we also couldn't believe it. We equaled uh, on points with the English, mm -hmm. but we went out on goal difference, so silver medal That's second time. So. And Siobhan, you were brought in, uh, Stephen had an injury and then you were brought in, am, am I correct? That's correct, I was sub for the team and mm -hmm. I was lucky enough I got to play for the, I got to play the semi-finals and the finals. And um, you're the only woman on the team, so how does that feel like? I think when it's, a, a, it's prominently a male sport anyway, so when you go out, you know, you've got to, you've got to play like them, I suppose, do your best. Um, they don't pick. They don't take pity on you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. Um, tell us a little bit how the tournaments work in polo. Um, how many games are played, and does that depend on the countries? And just for the folks at home that aren't so familiar with polo. Yeah. Well, the, um, there's an organisation called the FIP, mm -hmm. and they invite um, I think eight European teams in total okay. to take part, and um, then. It's up to the organization. For example, we had a sponsorship through Richard Fagan mm -hmm. and Silex, and um, they, he, he picks the best players that are available at the time, mm -hmm. and as do the other organizations, and then they all, all converge on, on Shanti okay. to play. And then how does the um, tournament in Shanti differ from, say, the World Championships um, qualifiers? Well the, well, the World Championship qualifiers is a much higher level. Okay. It's at a 14 goal level, which means yeah, all, all four players have to add up to 14 goals. So, um, and... Uh, is that kind of like a qualification to be able to play? To, like to an play MER in the World Cup, which is in Chile. Okay. And only one team qualifies out of four. Okay. And as I said, we tied, tied in first mm -hmm. place. But unfortunately, um, the English had actually had a better goal difference. Okay. Which means that they had two goals, scored two goals more than we did. Okay. And they went through on that. And um, coming back to the 14 goals, does that mean that you have to have 14 goals at the championships or before you get there? Or how does that work? No, it's actually got nothing to do with the amount of goals that you score. It's okay. all four players add up to, to a 14 goal handicap. Ah, okay. So the, the best players in the world are 10. And when you start polo, you're minus two. Okay. So um, our combination was four, 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 two. Okay. So, yeah. Um, Siobhan, you might just tell me a little bit about um, your position and, and um, where you play and that type of thing. Yeah, I play at home. We have a polo club at home, Polo Wicklow, which my father started in 1993. We're the only all year round polo facilities. So I was lucky enough to get into polo about 12 years ago through, through my father. My father's been playing for 40, 50 years. But when I was growing up, there wasn't really any way of getting into polo unless your parents were playing. Okay. So I was lucky enough when I was 18 I started I started playing and kind of haven't looked back since then so. Okay so 18 I mean that was relatively old I suppose some, you know to start playing polo would you have been tricking around before that? Um, not really my father never really wanted me to play I was big into the eventing and, and all of that so I was quite happy doing my thing and he was quite happy with his daughter not playing okay. a man's sport. <laughs> so yeah. um, then I just came back from school one day and they said, oh, today you're going to play. There was another lady starting at the same time. But yes, there, I didn't really have the opportunity when I was younger. There was no Pony Club Polo in my area and there was no other way of getting into it. And, you know, when you're when you're only eight, nine years old, you're not really wanting to ride horses. Okay. Despite them being called Polo Ponies, they are they are actually, you know, they're horses, they're 15 hands and above. So there wasn't, unfortunately, there just wasn't that opportunity for me to start earlier. And um, what about you, Sebastian? How did you get into it? Well, my, my father had the first ever polo school, I think, recorded in the world, and it was set up in Waterford in 1975. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to get a lot of, I think, in total, I think 38 different nationalities like, all around the world used to converge, come to Ireland and learn how to play. Wow. And uh, yeah, so I was very, very lucky I, I had it. I'd, you know, at my disposal at a very young age. 
Okay, and Siobhan, another um, question that I have, you know when you go to championships, obviously um, polo is quite intense on the horses. Um, do you play with one horse throughout or do you have different horses? Do you bring your own horses? How does that work? Um, in Shanti, I was lucky enough, obviously I was given, I had Stephen's horses. Okay. So each, I think you're, al you're allowed to, to five. Five, was it five horses five, yeah. per, per player. Okay. Um, and the, all the horses were numbered, so you weren't allowed to interchange the horses between teams or anything like that. So you were playing four chakas, which is seven and a half minutes. Okay. And mostly you would split two horses per chaka, just so you always had fresh horses. Okay. So they might play one or two chakas each, but you would split them so you've continuously got fresh power underneath you. Okay, and Sebastian, where are your horses based then? Is there a lot of travelling for them? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I've been based in the UK because um, the UK is the centre of polo in Europe, really. Okay. So it's very, very important um, to keep your finger on the pulse and play against all the top players in the world actually end up playing in the UK in the summer season. Okay. So that's where I base myself. But yeah, the ponies basically travel from there. Okay. Yeah. And so would you, as um, athletes, need about five horses each or more? Yeah. You'd, le you'd need, yeah, I mean, you would need more. I mean, you would need, I think, a minimum of about six ponies. With such success in the last few weeks, um, what are your aims now for 2015? Um, the, I'm trying to push Irish ladies polo a little bit more as well. A friend of mine's actually just gone off to Malaysia to play in a ladies tournament with some of the top players in the world, top lady players in the world. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was great as a female player to go out, not only to play on for your country, but also to be a female playing for your country, because you're also then promoting ladies polo in Ireland, because at the moment, the Irish polo gets forgotten about. Mm -hmm. So it's great to see Irish polo being put on the map. And, and like Sebastian said, they came back with two silver medals, yeah. which is quite something for a little country. We have only a handful of players to choose from. And we're competing against England, who, I mean, they're holding polo mallets before they can walk. Mm -hmm. And we're, we don't have that facilities over here. So, you know, for us even to be able to compete against them is quite something. Um, what about you, Sebastian, looking to 2015, what would be the main aims? Yeah, I think, I mean, we're very, like I said before, we're very lucky to have this sponsor and mm. uh, he's, he's wanting to take Irish polo forwards and, and do as many internationals as possible. I mean, uh, I believe we, um, we've been invited to play in the arena, uh, England against Wales, in, uh, in March wow. in England, which will be quite a big event. And th that's the, the future for us, is to do lots of events against internationals. And to try and get, you know, I think we need to get just the Pony Club involved and we need to get, you know, young players coming through so we can, we can mm -hmm. pick a good squad and have a bigger choice of players. And Siobhan, I think, is the first ever lady to play in the European Championships at that level. So I think that's incredible. And Sebastian, when, what makes Ryder so special um, at polo? What do you need to be um, a top class polo player? I th you just need the experience, I think, of, of actually working in the polo yards and... Um, doing doing the hard graft really of, of mucking out, finding out about the ponies, what exercise routines, uh, feeding habits, just being involved at a young age is, is or, or just being involved in the whole behind the scenes is very very important. And um, I noticed that you say polo ponies. Um, tell me a little bit about the horses and ponies that are needed uh, for polo. What makes them stand out from, um, you know, a horse in the field or, you know, what do you need when you're picking your horses? Ma majority of the horses that are used now are actually thoroughbreds. Mm -hmm. um, and the Irish thoroughbreds have now got a great name. There's a lot of people coming over from England. All the pros, a lot of the pros come from England over to buy Irish thoroughbreds. The best way to describe it is what you're looking for is a Mini Cooper body with a Ferrari engine. Okay. You know, you're looking for something that's kind of short and compact yet speed of light okay. um, you want the shortness so that they're handy and, and quick on the stops and turns but you need the speed obviously so that you can you can keep up when you when you get ahead and I'd imagine their temperament is very important temperament is everything. yeah temperament, temperament is, is everything yeah okay yeah and um, for people who want to get involved in polo, um, is there a specific age that you would recommend or what do you well, think? I, I think the younger like in most sports the, the younger you, you get involved the better um, but I mean, there are exceptions to the rule. There are people that start late and, and mm -hmm. become incredibly good at the sport. If they're, um, for example, in the in club in Waterford, we had a, a couple of hurlers who came in because of their hand-eye coordination. I mean, they could they could hit the ball incredibly, which was very very impressive. Uh, and then you can get the other um, range of the spectrum if they can ride well and they haven't mm -hmm. played many ball sports before, they can pick it up just as quick. But I think the general advice would be as young as, young as, 
as possible. And um, like you mentioned, hand-eye coordination and athleticism, they must be um, the very, key, yeah. yeah, very key. Oh, key, absolutely, yeah. But also the, the amazing thing about polo is it's the, the tactics as well. So it's just not, you know, four people on a team running after a ball. You have to you protect your, your best player or your, and you have your individual positions as in fullback, midfield, striker, um, stopping their best player. You have set plays. Um, so not only is it a, a team sport and a ball sport, um, you're also controlling an animal, which is just, mm -hmm. it's, it's just the most incredible sport. And Javon, speaking of tactics, um, would you as a team have different tacti tactics for each game? Um, like, do you watch the other teams and then make your tactics? How does it work? Very much so. Also, it depends what level you're playing. You know, when I before I went over to, to play with Sebastian, I was used to being one of the stronger players on the team. And all of a sudden, I was playing with two guys who were much stronger than me. And it was now my job to protect them, keep somebody away so that they could play. Okay. So I had to change my game quite rapidly. Yeah. And it took me a, it took me a bit to get into it, but I, once I got into it, it was you kind of set your mind on it and that's what you've got to do. But you do, you watch the other games play, you watch their matches and you can see where their strongest players are, the mistakes that they make, where you can push them and that kind of a thing. And speaking of strongest players, do strongest players always play in a certain position or might the strongest player be a, a one today or a four tomorrow? Or how does it work? Um, I suppose generally they play kind yeah. of in the middle or towards the yeah, back. Number, or number three yeah. is, is the strongest player, which is like midfield back. Okay. And they control the centre of the field. And at the top, top level, funny enough, the number one position is the, is the hardest position to play. Okay. But at, at the level that we play, the number three position is the most important position. Okay, Sebastian and Siobhan, thank you very much for coming in today and um, I wish you all the success in 2015. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.